Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for Chapter Book Storytime today. We're going to continue in the Saturdays. We're reading Chapter 7 today by Elizabeth and Wright. And um, before we get started though, I want to tell you now so that you can be excited as I am. Later this week, on Wednesday, we're going to be starting to read the best Christmas pageant ever. This is a fabulous book by Barbara Robinson. If you've never read it, you have got to listen in. It's going to be really fun. So hope you enjoy that and look forward to it. In the meantime, we have two more chapters left, chapter seven and chapter eight. So let's go ahead and get started. This one is called Saturday Seven. <laughs> so what it's come to is this, father told them the next day. He had called them all into the study. We're going to have a new furnace, an oil one this time that doesn't cause so much trouble. Well, what about Willie Slopper? interrupted Randy anxiously. If we have an oil furnace, what'll Willie do? Father smiled. Don't you worry, Randy. There'll always be work for Willie in this house. He's practically a member of the family. That was a relief to everyone. <clears throat> now, a new oil furnace costs at least $200, continued Father. I don't pay much more than that in rent every summer for the Valley House. This house we own. It's ours. But though there's no rent, there is a mortgage and there are taxes. In addition to that, it needs new wallpaper, the roof has to be fixed, and the third floor stairway has to be repaired before it goes down like a stack of dominoes. All that costs money, and an authority on economics always seems to be just as poor or a little poorer than other people. It's going to be a rather a struggle. What I'm trying to tell you is this. We'll have to forget about the valley this summer. I hate telling you that you'll have to stay in this hot city, but I don't know, I don't know what else to do. Maybe a couple of weeks at the shore in August. That's the most I can promise. There was an appalled silence. Well, Mona said at last, other people do it. I guess we can, if they can. We have the yard, added Rush, and the roof. And there's Central Park, said Randy, and the tops of buses and the hose. We can cool off in the hose. Oh boy, cried Oliver. That's what I like, cooling off in the hose. Well, you're good kids, father said. There never were any better ones. Cleaner, maybe, or quieter but never any better. And another thing, Randy said, I'm president of the ISAAC, so it's all right for me to suggest it. We don't really need as much allowance as you give us. Why, I bet we could get along fine on a quarter a piece, couldn't we, kids? Except Oliver, of course. I can get along on a nickel, interrupted Oliver stoutly. After all, money isn't everything, said Randy, rather proud of herself, as if she had made a remarkable discovery. You're good kids, repeated father. He didn't seem to be able to think of anything else to say. Then there's the pig, if necessary, offered Rush. The what? Father looked startled. The pig bank in the office, Rush explained. It's got about a dollar and 96 cents in it. Maybe more by now. It's not much, of course, but if you could use it. Oh, oh, thanks, Rush, father said. But I don't think I'm reduced to that just yet. You keep it in case of emergency. The first few days were fine. They all felt self-sacrificing and practical and practiced economy with zeal. Every unnecessary light was turned off. The telephone was hardly ever used. They took all the empty ginger ale bottles back to the grocery and went by the good humor man with their faces averted. That means the, the good humor man is the ice cream man who drove the truck around town. And so if they didn't look at him, then they weren't gonna ask to buy ice cream. But by Thursday, it became very hot. The, the ailanthus trees were in profuse full leaf. Through the open windows of the house drifted the myriad noises of other people's living. Radios quacking away, typewriter keys pecking, dishes clacking together in sinks, voices talking, pianos being played, and a woman singer who practiced scales dutifully hour after hour, day by day. You know, Ran, Mona confided that day after school, I keep thinking of the valley. Last night, I dreamed about it. Do you remember the Bob Whites? They say Bob, and then they take a deep breath, and they say White afterward. I know, said Randy, and the morning doves, and the way they sound so far away, even if they're right in, in the tree up above you. I love morning doves. The whole summer in the valley always sounded of them. Up in the office, Rush was playing the piano. He started to thunder through the revolutionary etude, as usual, and then stopped. Nuts, he exclaimed. Something had happened to a note in the middle register. It plinked like a guitar and ruined the whole effect. There was a pretty good piano in the valley house. Oh, nuts, 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 repeated Rush unhappily. 
and closed the lid. And besides the piano, there was a tennis court at the valley and a dammed up pool in the brook where they swam. The water was dark and tingling and cold. Randy said it was like swimming in iced root beer. Besides that, there was the tree house Rush had built in the beech tree where no one else could come unless invited. There was the carpentry shop in the garage. There were the sales kids on the next farm who, hold on, who had a hayloft as big as a hotel ballroom and the horses to ride on, a mother who made the kind of pie that you think of when you say the word pie. Nuts, repeated Rush. He went back to the piano, opened the lid, and crashed roughly down on the keys with his two closed fists. It made a good, loud, angry noise. What's the matter with you, inquired Oliver, coming in. He was wearing an Indian war bonnet, and there were four cap pistols stuck in his belt. Oh, nothing. Rush closed the piano lid sheepishly. Come on, Hiawatha, let's find something to do. We might rig up a wigwam for you in the backyard. Let's see if Cuffy will give us an old sheet. Boy, commented Oliver enthusiastically, galloping out of the office beside his brother on a non-existent piano pony, or pinto pony. <laughs> Saturday was a day of out of August by mistake. Saturday was a day out of August by mistake. Not even the shades flapped in the open windows. In their economical mood, the ISAAC members had planned no excursion for themselves, and now they were sorry. Randy lay on the floor. I'm so bored, she groaned, exactly as she had groaned on a wet Saturday many weeks before. As if in reply, the telephone downstairs began to ring. Nobody paid attention. Cuffy always answered it. And it was probably for father anyway. We might get on a subway and see how far it goes, and then get off and go exploring, suggested Mona. We might go to Brooklyn or Astoria or the Bronx or some other interesting place. Educational and inexpensive, agreed Rush without much enthusiasm. Lugubriously, he began to play the Chopin Funeral March for Randy's benefit. She adored funeral marches. Oh, Randy, shouted Cuffy from downstairs. Yes, Cuffy? Telephone, hurry. Telephone for me. Randy sprang to her feet. Oh, I hope it's something nice. Probably just that bird-brained Dorothy Janeway wanting to gossip again, said Rush gloomily. But it wasn't Dorothy Janeway this time. Randy came back looking pleased. She demonstrated her pleasure by a series of glissades and two high leaps. Do I remind you of Zarina, she said. You remind me of a kangaroo, replied Rush absentmindedly. Come across, Randy. What was the telephone call about? We're all going out for tea, she told him. Mrs. Oliphant's invited us to have tea with her at the zoo. Even me, asked Oliver, who was up to his ears in plastis plasticine. Of course, you two, all of the ISAAC members. You'll like it. Tea doesn't mean tea, it means ice cream. Well, that's a break, said Rush. I like Mrs. Oliphant. When are we going? Oh, in about an hour, four o'clock, she told me. I suppose we'll have to get cleaned up, Rush said wistfully, gazing at the front of his shirt. It bore the marks of interesting encounters with chalk, maple syrup, machine oil, and good plain dirt. Oh yes, spick and span, of course. I am even going to wear a hat. I wonder where my straw hat is. I haven't seen it since last summer. Randy went leaping out of the room and they could hear her calling. Cuffy, where's my straw hat? And Cuffy's muffled answer from the kitchen. My lands, child, I don't know. Did you look in the storeroom? Randy went into the storeroom and turned on the light. There were no windows. The place was full of things, winter clothes in moth-proof bags, two old cribs, the family high chair, a couple of suitcases, though most of these were kept in the basement. Uh, everybody's ice skates, quantities of books and old magazines, stacks of framed pictures, many, many other things, including a sewing machine and the stately dressmaker's form, size 40 that Cuff built her dresses on. Randy got so hot looking for her hat that she finally took off her dress and hung it up on the light bracket. By the time she discovered the hat, she had discovered several other things as well. Cuffy's old pattern books, for instance, had forgotten Halloween, a forgotten Halloween costume and a snapshot album full of pictures that she wanted to look at. Bearded with dust, wearing a petticoat and her straw hat, Randy last, at last emerged from the storeroom, her arms full. She banged the door shut behind her with her foot. Careless Randy. In the storeroom, the electric light burned brightly as before. 
and as the door slammed shut, a sudden draft lifted the wide collar of the dress she had hung on the bracket and dropped it over the bulb. Cuffy, said Randy, coming down the stairs slowly, did you ever really wear clothes like the ones in this pattern book? What on heaven's name is all that truck, inquired Cuffy. Here, let me look. She held the book far away so that she could see it better. Why, that's not so long ago, 1926. 1926, repeated Randy. Even Mona wasn't born then. Why, it's a terribly long time ago. It is? Well, I guess it is. Well, that's how we dressed. Hats pulled down over our ears like they were football helmets. Skirts up to the knee. Belts almost down to the knee. Cuffy, even you? Certainly not. Oh, certainly me. Why not? <laughs> Added Cuffy haughtily. I only weighed around 146 then. Well, I don't know how you could wear things like that. I should think it would make you feel silly. You never can tell, said Cuffy. Someday the clothes you're wearing now will look just as outlandish to you. Things change. Time changes them. Time, announced Rush, poking his head out the door. Time marches on. March on yourself, my fine young man, scolded Cuffy. You can't go till you're clean, and, you can, and you'll never get clean without taking a bath. At last, Radiant was scrubbing, wearing their best clothes, and with the ISAAC pins sparkling on their chests, they left the house. Upstairs in the closed storeroom, there was only the faintest odor of hot cloth. Oh, no. The bus ride was hot and horrible because all the top seats were taken, but once they got to Central Park, everything was all right. Mrs. Oliphant met them wearing a flowered dress and a hat that Rush privately thought looked like an order of fruit salad. The terrace of the restaurant was cool and shady, and they sat under an umbrella and ate ice cream. In the pool below the terrace, a sea lion floated peacefully with his hand flippers, with his hind flippers out, and another swarm to <laughs> Another swam to and fro under the water, emerging at in regular intervals, blowing noisily and disappearing again. The Melendees told Mrs. Oliphant all about the coal gas experience. They all told her. It was really quite an important and interesting thing that had happened to them now that it was over. But now we have to buy a new furnace and a lot of other things, so we can't go to the country this summer because we haven't got enough money, Randy told her expan expansively. Rush glowered at her, and Mona gave her a kick under the table. Randy felt a hot red blush rising from her collar collarbone to the top of her head. Well, we like it, though, she added lamely. We really like staying here. There's the park and the backyard, and rides on ferry boats and ever so many things to do, even if we don't have as much allowance as we used. Rush kicked her again, so hard that she couldn't help saying, ouch, Mona changed the subject. Oh, Mrs. Oliphant, she was saying in an animated voice. I love your bracelet. Isn't it sweet? Did it come from France? Usually, Rush hated it when Mona acted like that. It always made him want to be tough and slangy, by contrast. But today, he was grateful to her. Mona could usually be counted on to save a situation. He had to admit that. No, Mrs. Oliphant said in a deep, old voice. It came from Venice. My husband bought it for me in 1911. Randy went on eating her ice cream. It was so cool and comforting and delicious that by and by it cooled away the blush that she felt, that then she felt all right again. In the closed storeroom at home, the smell of burnt cloth was now very noticeable, but there was nobody there to smell it except a brindled old mouse who hastily departed to the second floor by a secret channel in the wall. In the collar of the dress that Randy had left on the bracket, there was now a hole with brown fringed edges. It grew larger second by second. The brown fringes withered and curled. A tendril of blue smoke rose upward. And then all of a sudden there was a tiny flame licking and licking away at the collar. 1911, continued Mrs. Oliphant. That must have been the year I met your father for the first time. Father, how old was he? They cried. Oh, 11 or 12. Bored to death he was. He'd been dragged all over Europe from museum, to, from museum to art gallery to cathedral. But I fixed that. I took him to Florian's in the Piazza San Marco and fed him ices, just as I'm feeding them to you. Only instead of seals to look at, there, there were pigeons, thousands of them, tame as a barnyard full of hens. And I took him riding on, in gondolas and I introduced him to a family of other American children who were visiting there. The littlest girl was named Nora. She was only three or four and always tagged about and getting in the way. I remember your father said to me, anybody under six years old should be kept in a cage. 
The funny thing is that years later, he married her. <gasps> Mother, they cried. What did she look like then? Randy asked. Like Mona, rather. Only, of course, a little littler, or much littler. She had very dark, large eyes <clears throat> and a tangle of yellow curls. She wore a huge ribbon bow in her hair. When she grew up, she looked hardly any different, except that she no longer wore a bow. Upstairs in the storeroom at home, Randy's dress was blazing cheerfully. Hungrily, the flames reached out and caught at the succulent folds of the, for the moth-proof bag that contained Father's dress suit. Soon that was blazing, too. Mm. Mrs. Oliphant set down her teacup and looked at them. Did you know that I own a lighthouse? She added, inquired suddenly. A lighthouse, repeated Randy. She had a picture of Mrs. Oliphant polishing the lenses of a giant lamp and directing its rays to the storm-tossed ships at sea. At least it was a lighthouse, Mrs. Oliphant corrected herself, and everything is there but the light, the tower and the house and the ocean and the rocks. A lighthouse to live in, that sounds neat, Rush said. It is neat, agreed Mrs. Oliphant. Why don't you all come and spend the summer in it? It's a big place and there's plenty of room now that my children are grown and married. There's still room for them when they come to visit as well as room for you. You can live in the tower. In the lighthouse itself? Rush's eyes were glowing. So were Mona's and Randy's and Oliver's in the lighthouse itself, replied Mrs. Oliphant. But isn't it, I mean, wouldn't it be an Im, um, imposition, said Mona uncomfortably. I knew and loved both your father and mother from the time they were children, said Mrs. Oliphant, and it would give me great pleasure to have their children with me in my lighthouse. There, does that sound as if I were being imposed upon? No, I suppose it doesn't, Mona admitted. And when I get tired of you, I'll lock you all up in the tower with nothing to eat but bread and water or maybe milk and a jar of Mrs. Wilkins' cookies. I'll telephone your father this very evening and see what he has to say about it. <clears throat> at home, at that moment, father came bursting out of his study. He lifted up his nose and sniffed. Cuffy, shouted father, what's burning? Cuffy came out of the kitchen, drying her hands on the apron. Burning, Mr. Melanie? Why, nothing down here, I'm just... She looked up the stairway at him and then beyond. Her eyes opened wide. Oh, my lands, Mr. Melanie, look upstairs. It must be fire. Isaac began to bark as father raced up the stairs with Cuffy panting and thumping behind him. Above the noise, they could hear an ominous crackling and snapping as they reached the top floor. The Melanie children walked to Fifth Avenue with Mrs. Oliphant. They walked very slowly so that they couldn't spoil the lovely coolness inside them created by the ice cream. Randy was hanging onto one of the old lady's arms and Oliver was hanging onto the other. Mona was carrying her knitting bag. Rush was just walking along, monopolizing the conversation. Gee, I always thought it would be swell to live in a lighthouse, he was saying. From the first time I ever saw one when I was five years old. <clears throat> I bet the swimming's keen too, isn't it? Yes, the swimming is extremely keen, said Mrs. Oliphant. She said it just at the very second that father was shouting to Cuffy to call the fire department. Tell them to hurry, he told her. Mrs. Oliphant said goodbye to them at 64th Street, and they got on a bus going downtown. There were plenty of top seats now, and a wind that was almost cool rose up to meet them as the bus jolted and bucked along the avenue. Oh boy, what a break, Rush kept saying. Wouldn't it be swell if father said yes? Do you think he, she really meant it? Randy asked. I suppose so, Mona said. After you told her that we were practically paupers, what else could she do? It's charity, that's what it is. Well, so what's the matter with charity? Rush said unexpectedly. Don't you think it's dumb to say no out of some sort of cockeyed pride? When somebody you like wants to give you a present that you want to take, she likes us and we like her. She has a lighthouse and no one to appreciate it now that her kids are all grown up. I don't see anything wrong with that. I think it's swell and I think she is too. I do too, Randy said wholeheartedly. Rush was wonderful, she thought. As for being paupers, we're not, he went on. Any man with a house and four children and a dog and a housekeeper and a furnace man has to be a millionaire to be rich. Well, we're not rich by a long shot but neither are we paupers. All right, said Mona meekly, I believe you. After they got off the bus, they walked through the street almost to their own block before they saw the fire engines. A fire, yelped Rush joyfully, breaking into a run. They all ran with him, Mona holding on to Oliver's jacket to keep him from dashing into the street. My goodness, I think it's our house, croaked Rush. I think so too, said Mona, and Randy began to cry. She couldn't help it. Where's Cuffy? asked Oliver, bouncing along beside Mona. 
Will they have to carry her down a ladder, do you think? Oh, be still, Oliver, and quit bawling, Ran, ordered Rush. Look, one of the engines is going away. Everything's probably all right. You don't see any smoke, do you? You don't see any fire? There's father now, gasped Randy gladly. And she raced right past a policeman, two firemen, and up the steps into father's arms. What happened? What happened? cried Randy, her arms tight around him. Are you all right? Really? I'm all right, and Cuffy's all right. Is Isaac all right? Rush, Rush asked breathlessly. We're all all right. There was a small fire in the storeroom. That's all. It's out now. Can't imagine how it started. Do any of you have any idea? Nobody had any. Randy kept her arms around father, feeling weak with relief. None of you went in there today, did you? Didn't leave a light burning or anything? Queried a fireman who had been talking to father. Randy backed away from her father suddenly. I was there, she said in a horrified voice. I don't remember if I turned the light off. Maybe I didn't. Could that have done it? Sure could, sister, said the fireman. Bad wiring, or maybe something was hanging too close to the bulb. My dress, moaned Mona, or Randy. I hung my dress on the light while I was looking for my hat. It's all my fault, and she began to cry again. First coal gas, then a fire, and now a flood, said father, <gasps> exasperatedly. The harm's done. It's too late to wail about it, Randy. Perhaps next time you'll be more careful, that's all. Not go about hanging your clothes over light bulbs in that extraordinary way. Your winter coat and my dress suit and high chair and a set of Thackeray seem to be all that's gone. The storeroom is a mess, charred black, soaking wet. And they've chopped a wall full of holes, had to, but I'm covered by insurance, luckily. Well, that's a break anyway, said Rush for the third time that day. Then he turned to Randy. Remember, I was the one who left the furnace door open when we almost suffocated, he comforted her. You're no worse than I am. Pale and chastened, Randy helped Cuffy with the dishwashing after dinner. Willie Slopper was bringing barrels of debris down from the storeroom. When Randy set out the empty milk bottles in the, gate, in the airy way, area way, she saw something she hadn't expected, somehow. Regal and imposing, even in the state of charred ruin, Cuffy's dressmaker's form stood in lonely distinction beside the garbage can and the trash barrels. Oh, Cuffy, did that get burned too? Never you mind, my lamb, Cuffy said. For about a year now, I've been too stout to get into a size 40, and that dress form's been kind of on my conscience. Now, thank goodness I won't have to reduce. Here's a picture of her looking out the window and seeing the dress form. <laughs> that is the end of chapter 7. All right, we'll see you guys all tomorrow for the final chapter of the Saturdays. Have a great night.